Then let me uh, share my screen on my iPad. Okay, so uh, I would like to have a look into uh, tutorial, tutorial uh, three first. Hold on. Okay, so um for tutorial three and four, right? Okay, uh it's under the same topic. Okay, it's called aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So it is divided into two parts. Okay, so when you revise for tutorial three and four, just remember that these two are uh, actually belong to the to the same topic. Okay, so tutorial three is more on like understanding what is aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Uh as for tutorial four, it's more on applications. Okay, so first of all, when we talk about tutorial three, two things we are going to look into. Uh, one is called aggregate demand and one is called aggregate supply. So let's get started with the aggregate demand part first. So in the previous class, right, uh, I've shown you a circular flow of income. And from that diagram itself, we have really learned that aggregate demand equals to the combination of the consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Exports minus imports over here means your net exports. Okay, so these are the four components that we refer to in the economy. Yeah, so when I say aggregate demand, I'm referring to the total level of demand in the economy. So the word aggregate means total. So therefore, when I say aggregate demand means the total level of demand, okay, for the goods and services in the economy, which consists of the four components, which are consumptions, investment, government spending, and net exports, in which I can write into this equation itself. Okay, so the next thing that I want to look into is uh, when we look into aggregate demand curve, okay, what it shows. So aggregate demand, right, shows the relationship between the price level and the quantity of the real GDP demanded. So that means price level will be by, on my Y axis and quantity of real GDP will be my X axis. So now, same thing like how you learn uh, the demand and supply diagrams in your microeconomics. When you learn about demand and supply, you learn about price factor and non-price factors. Similarly, when you look into macro, we will learn about price factor and non-price factors for aggregate demand as well as aggregate supply as well. Now, bear in mind, we do not use the word demand anymore. We use the word aggregate demand or total demand. Why? Because this is macroeconomics. We look into the economy as a whole. We are not referring to the one particular item itself anymore, but we look into all the goods and services in the economy. So therefore, we call it as total demand. So do not write demand anymore in macro, but we're looking into total demand or you can use the word aggregate demand. Yeah. So similarly, we are going to learn about price factor and non-price factor. Okay. So when we talk about price factor, we know that basically that's caused, caused by the price itself. The change in the quantity of real GDP is caused by the price itself. Yeah. So when we talk about price factor, there is no shift. It's only the movement along the uh, straight line or the AD curve. Now let's have a look into the uh, diagram over here. Now this is my aggregate demand curve. As I told you, okay, aggregate demand curve looks into the relationship between price level and real GDP, right? So therefore, on my y-axis, okay, on my y-axis, it will be called price level. Do not need to write the GDP deflator. I will explain to you what does it mean, why, why we put 100 over here. But when you, def when you write your y-axis, just put price level, okay? What does it mean? Now, first of all, why I can't write prices anymore? Because in microeconomics, when we write prices, right, we are referring to the prices of the product, of one item. But here, as I say, I'm looking into all the goods and services. I'm looking into the economy as a whole. So therefore, I'm not referring to the price of a single product anymore. And therefore, I have to use price level. That means it's actually looking into a basket of goods and services. Okay, the prices of a basket of goods and services. When we talk about price level, it's actually in the form of index format. So, for example, if I say 100, 100 means that uh, the, when the index is 100, that means that the price is, uh, uh, the, the situation is where there is no inflation, no deflation. 
Okay, so if let's say I show that the price level goes up from 100 to 110, that means the price level has gone up. That means that uh, that means that the price becomes more expensive. So remember, 100 here is the base price or the uh, the base price over here in which there is neither inflation nor deflation. Okay, when price goes up from 100 to 110, that means your price level, your price level has gone up. If let's say the price level has fallen from 100 to 90, that means that my price level has been falling down. Okay, so therefore, this is why when we, look, when we look into price level, right, we put index format, okay, which is 100 above or below the 100. Like this one is 115 over here. Okay, so that means initially this is my uh, my initial point. Okay, at the price level of 115, the quantity of real GDP demanded is 12. Okay, so... Aggregate demand curve just like demand curve itself, in which is a downward sloping curve. So that means that here we can see one relationship, okay? A high price level will result in a lower quantity of real GDP demanded, okay? And vice versa, a lower price level will lead to a higher quantity real GDP demanded. Okay, so this is the inverse relationship that you can see from the uh, demand curve itself. Okay, now how do we explain this inverse relationship between the price and the quantity that? When you learn in micro, okay, you learn that uh, that can be explained by the income and the substitution effect. Now, bear in mind with the use of words, I'm talking about the effects, not factors. Okay, same thing here. To explain this relationship, okay, I can use the wealth effect and substitution effects. Okay, so again, this one, this is the relationship, okay, the relationship that we have seen from the aggregate demand curve, okay, and we can, exp so that means here you can see it's caused by the price level, okay, that affects the change in quantity of real GDP demanded. So we can explain it using these two effects, which is wealth effect and substitution effect. So the first one, wealth effect, that means it refers to your purchasing power. So for example, let's say when price level increases already, okay, that reduce your purchasing power, okay? So you are not able to buy as much of goods and services as compared to before, okay? So you will not uh, you will not buy so much of goods and services. Therefore, quantity of real GDP demanded has fallen down, okay? That's the meaning of wow effect. So the keywords of wow effect, when you want to explain it, please link it to purchasing power. This right there with wealth effect, you link it to purchasing power. Don't worry if you miss anything because I later I will show you one full answers. So that you can actually attract some of the points, okay? Now, the next one is substitution effect. When you talk about substitution effect, right, you can explain it through intertemporal and international substitution effect, okay? So, uh, what is intertemporal uh, substitution effect? So, intertemporal effect, uh, inter intertemporal substitution effect means we are referring to the interest rate. Okay, so I repeat, when we talk about substitution effect, there are two. One is intertemporal and one is international. Intertemporal refers to interest rate. Okay, what do I mean by that? Eh? Okay, see, eh? see, let's say now the price level, okay, has gone up. Sorry. Okay. Let's say the price level has gone up. That means things become more and more expensive, right? Okay, so when things are becoming more and more expensive, do you need more money, okay, in order for you to purchase more goods and services? Yeah, you need to you need to have more cash, right? So there will be an increase in the transaction demand for money. Okay, there will be more, more transactional demand for money. What is transactional demand for money? That means the money that you need to buy the goods and services. Transactional demand. Okay, more transactional demand for money. Okay, so therefore. Now, when you need more money, so if today I look into a money market, so this one you haven't learned yet, but you're learning in the upcoming classes. Okay, so I'm just telling you how is that interest rate being affected? How is that interest rate being brought in over here? Okay, so we have origin here. This is my interest rate, okay, on my y-axis. And on my x-axis over here is the uh, quantity of money, quantity of real money. I just put quantity of money. Now, money supply is a waste fix, okay? And money demand will be like your normal demand curve like this, okay? So, assuming this is the initial point, okay? At this amount of quantity of money, at this interest rate, 
Okay, so what happened is if today when the price level has increased, you will need more cash, right? So the money demand will increase. So when money de demand increases, it shifts rightwards. And can you tell me where is the new equilibrium point? So when it shifts rightwards, it goes to here. And then after that, it will move back to here because this is the or uh, the equilibrium, the intersection between money supply and money demand. So therefore, in the new equilibrium, can you tell me what you can observe over here? The interest rate has gone up. So do you, what can you see over here then? Today, when the price level has become more expensive, what happened is you will demand more of the cash, more transactional demand for money, and therefore, when the money demand curve shift rightwards, that will result in a higher interest rate. So that's why it call as intertemporal effect. When, let's say, now price level have gone up, it will cause the interest rate to go up as well, and therefore, that increases your cost of borrowing. So when cost of borrowing becomes higher, it's not easy for you to buy as much of goods as compared to before anymore. Yeah, so that's the explanation of the intertemporal substitution effects. Now, if you find it hard to put it into words, don't worry, later we are going to see some full sentences. But at least I want you to remember intertemporal effect means interest rate. And that's how interest rate is being in, uh, related over here. The next one is international substitution effect. International substitution effect means that uh, we're talking about, like for example, now since price level have gone up, so similarly, we go back to the same scenario. So now we are saying that price level have gone up. So therefore, that means your things will become more expensive as compared to others. So definitely your products, the local products, not only expensive to the local people, but also expensive for the foreigners. So at the end of the day, there will be less people buying your goods and services and resulting in a fall in the quantity of real GDP demanded. Now, bear in mind today, all the change in the quantity of real, GD real GDP demanded over here, okay, is caused by the price of the product itself, caused by the price level in the country, not because of other factors, not because of any external factors, but because of the price level of the goods and services in the economy itself. So that's why it's called as price level. So that is for price factor. Okay, all good, huh? So let's move on to the next one, which is non-price factor. Okay, so as the word suggests, right? Non-price factors, that means I'm referring to any other factors other than the price of the product itself. Okay, so uh, here we are referring to the shift, okay? The shift of aggregate demand curve, okay? So that means that, again, on my y-axis price level, on my right axis, it, on my x-axis is real GDP. Make sure you label it, huh? So you don't have to label until it's so complicated like GDP deflator 2000 equals 100, no need. Here it's just saying that, uh, you know, like in, two, in year 2000, they expect that there is no inflation and deflation. So we assume that in year 2000, the price level is 100. Yeah, so you don't have to label that. Okay, so here that means that your price level remains the same, but either more or less is being uh, demanded. So, so for example, let's say uh, when it shifts rightwards, Let's say from point A to point B, when it shift rightwards, that means what? That means my aggregate demand increases. Okay, aggregate demand shift rightwards. When the aggregate demand shift leftwards, okay, that means aggregate demand decreases. Okay, decrease. Okay, so what can cause the uh the change in aggregate demand then? Okay, so one tip, uh, okay, do not look into the points here first. I want to give you one tip, but you follow these tips. Uh. Today, right, okay, when, remember when we talk about aggregate demand, what are the four components again? Consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. So as long as there is any change in these four components, it will affect the aggregate demand. So for example, they are increased in consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports, okay, that will affect aggregate demand curve to shift either rightwards or leftwards. Hold on, let me remove the one. Okay, so later on, we are going to look into some points, but I want you to see a trend over here, okay? What will actually uh, cause the aggregate demand to shift rightwards or leftwards are basically these four components. 
You see, is when you look into these four components, are you still looking into the price factor itself? No more. Yeah, we are looking into consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports in influencing the shift of aggregate demand curve. Nothing to do with the price itself. I have never mentioned about price. Huh? Okay, so that's why it's called non-price factor. So let's have a look into some points over here and see if it's linked. Okay, see if it's linked to these tips that I told you here. So next time when you look into any exam questions, as long as the exam questions give you any of these components that can be linked here, either consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports, that means they will fully shift aggregate demand already. Okay, let's have a look into the first one, changes in expectations. Like for example, households. Let's say households suddenly decide to save less and consume more. Consumption increases. Okay, firms want to invest more. Investment increases. And therefore, it shifts the aggregate demand curve. Okay. Let's have a look in the second scenario. Changes in the government policies. Let's say uh, in the upcoming chapters, we are going to learn fiscal and monetary policy. And when we learn about policies, there will be expansionary and contractionary. So although now you haven't learned that yet, but bear in mind, expansionary means you want to increase the aggregate demand. Contractionary means you want to decrease the aggregate demand. Okay, so for example, let's say they want to use expansionary fiscal and monetary policy. That means it's to increase the aggregate demand. So, for example, they increase the government spending and reduce the taxation under fiscal policy. Okay, increase government spending. Uh, okay, or monetary policy, they increase the money supply, they reduce the interest rate. Okay, all this will cause people to spend more, correct or not? So, at the end, this will also shift the aggregate demand rightwards. Same with the first one. Okay, the last one changes in foreign variables. Like, for example, let's say your currency has been depreciated. Okay, that means now uh, your local currency is losing its international value. That means foreigners are easier for you, for them to buy your local currency. Like for example, let's say Ringgit Malaysia depreciated. So foreigners will be easier to exchange their money to our local currency. So that means that now your products will become, will become cheaper, okay, for the foreigners to buy. So therefore what happened is this will increase your exports and reduce your imports so when i look into net exports i look into exports minus imports so overall net exports will increase and net export is one of the component of aggregate demand that will shift the aggregate demand curve rightwards so therefore can you see one thing here all the aggregate demand curve here shift rightwards does it have anything to do with the price of the product no i have never mentioned anything about the price it's because of all these external factors that's what i call as non-price factors yeah, so that sums up for the aggregate demand part. Okay, all good. Yeah, so then we will move on to the next one then. Okay, aggregate supply. Now, the aggregate supply here is a bit different as compared to the supply that we learned before. Why? Because last time in micro, when you learn about supply, you only learn one supply curve. But here in macroeconomics, when you learn about supply, it can be divided into short run supply curve and long run supply curve. We call it a short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply. Okay, now first of all, we need to know uh, what, what does we mean by aggregate supply? That means we look into the total amount of outputs, okay, which is your real GDP, okay, that the firms in an economy are willing and able to supply at different prices in a given time period. So therefore, later on, when we look into aggregate supply curve, again, we look into the relationship between the price level and the quantity of real GDP supply, okay? Now, we have two components here, okay? We have two types of supply curve here. One is called short-run aggregate supply, and the, another one is long-run aggregate supply. Now, short-run aggregate supply, okay? Here, we assume that uh, your the money wages, the wages, okay, and other factor prices are constant. So that means uh, in the short-run aggregate supply, uh, the wages itself, the salary itself will still be constant. That means today, right, if let's say in the short run, the price level of goods and services have increased, if you are as a producer, you want to produce more of the product, right? Correct or not? Because of a profit in incentive. But actually, uh, when you want to produce more of the product, uh, the workers will come to you and say, hey, you asked me to produce more, eh? you should pay more, ma. correct or not? But in the short run, we assume that that will not happen. Because in the short run, it is a time frame where, okay, when you want to produce more, you still can. And you're still paying them the same wages. 
So that means that the wages are still very constant, are still fixed. That means I can still pay my labor at the same rate as before, although now I want to ask them to produce more. So that's why I call a short run against supply. That means that the money wages or any of the factor prices or the resource prices remain constant. Okay, they, they, it's not flexible yet. I'm still paying them the same wages. Okay, now when I talk about long run against supply, this is when the money wages and the factor prices will be very flexible in which they will adjust ready. Okay, because uh, when we talk about long run, right, usually, okay, like for example, uh, when you want the workers to produce more, and especially when it has already reached a fully employed position, what happens is the workers will come to you and say, hey, you have been asking me to produce more and work over time. I really want a higher pay then. So that is when they will ask for higher wages and you have to pay higher wages. So your cost will increase already. Okay, so here when I say long run, long run means that all the factor prices will be adjustable. They will adjust based on the uh, current situation. Okay, and for long run aggregate supply, it's vertical. Why? Because it also shows the maximum capacity of the of the output that can be produced by the country. Okay, so therefore that basically shows the potential GDP. Okay, so th that means that that is the max, the maximum that you can achieve in the economy. And this one, it is independent, independent of the price level. We do not look into the price level anymore. That basically refers to the maximum capacity in which is the vertical line. Okay, similarly, we are going to look into price factor and non-price factor. So we talk about price factor, that means that the change in the quantity of real GDP is caused by the price level itself. And there is only a movement, no shift. Similarly, first of all, why axis is price level? Uh, and on my uh, x-axis is real GDP. And this is my SAS curve, short run aggregate supply curve. Okay, upward sloping, just like a normal supply curve. Like for example, at the price level of 115, okay, this is the point here, and at the quantity of uh, 12 trillion of real GDP. Okay, so what relationship can you see over here? You can see that when the price level becomes higher, quantity of real GDP supply will also become higher. Why? Because of profit incentive that you learned before. Higher price, of course, you want to sell more. Why is that so? Because it's uh, more profitable for you. Okay. Uh, alternatively, when the price level has gone down, quantity of real GDP supply will go down as well. Why is that so? Because it's not profitable to sell the product anymore. Okay, now why is that you are able to do so? Why is that today when the price level go up, you can sell more? And why is that price level go down, you can straight cut down the production? It's because the wages are, have not been adjusted yet. We call it sticky wages or you can call it sticky prices. Basically means that the firms, okay, are, are often slow to adjust the wages. That means today if you want to produce more, still can. You can take advantage of that because you're still paying them the same wages and the workers will not come to you and ask for higher wages yet at this moment in the short run. Okay, so that explains the movement along the straight line for the supply curve. On the other hand, we have non-price factors. That means it is caused by the factors other than the prices. That basically means the shift, the shift of the short run aggregate supply curve or long run aggregate supply curve. Two scenario, okay, two scenario here, as you can see on my right-hand side over here. Let's have a look into the first scenario. If today, there is a change in the factor prices, change in factor prices, like for example, your money wages, the wages you have to pay increase, oil prices increase, price of raw materials increase, any of the price of resources increase, okay, or maybe the producers get subsidies, or there's tax being imposed on producers, all this, when it can affect the cost of production, when it affect the cost of production, that affects your short run aggregate supply curve. So anything related to the cost or the factor prices that will shift as a as a S curve. Okay. So for example, uh, let's say when all these costs, all these factor prices increases, when the cost increases, the SAS will shift leftwards. Okay, why? Because cost increase already, profitability will be reduced. So all the producers will produce less. Vice versa, when the cost becomes lower, that means it's more profitable to produce more. So SAS curve will shift rightwards. Okay. Now, 
in econs, right? Okay, sometimes when we want to see uh, uh whether the well, the scenario will impact either uh demand or supply, either aggregate demand or aggregate supply, okay, um uh, we 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 see from a very slightly different perspective. Like for example, I want to comment about these oil prices. Okay, like for example, today I say that uh there's an increase in the price of petrol. Okay, let's say there's an increase in the price of petrol. When I say there's an increase in the price of petrol, right? Okay, now which graph that it will it will affect either uh aggregate demand or aggregate supply? Okay, so in econs, right, we see from a very different perspective. So we see all these affect the producers first. Like for example, in the scenario that I told you just now, an increase in the price of petrol, we see that petrol will affect the cost of transportation. Okay, so therefore it will affect the short run aggregate supply. Okay, that's one thing. So because some students might say, hey, uh, how come cannot affect aggregate demand? Because uh, uh, an increase in the price of petrol means that today if I were to pump the petrol, I have to pay higher amount of money. Right? I have to spend more. Right? And that will affect my consumption. Right? We don't see it that way. Okay, we don't see it that way. We see it as a cost factor. So therefore, then there's an increase in the price of petrol that affects your cost of transportation. Another scenario, if today I say that that is an increase or there's a rise in the minimum wage in Malaysia from 1,005 to 1,008, for instance, which graph it will affect? Aggregate demand or aggregate supply? Now, again, students might say, hey, uh, isn't that affecting aggregate demand because minimum wage increase ma, from 1,005 to 1,008? That means uh, uh, there's more money to spend. Ma. No, we don't see that way in cons. When minimum wage is being imposed or when minimum wage is being uh, right, uh, big increase, okay, we see that there's an increase in the cost. An increase in the cost of what? Cost of labor. So that we consider that as increase in money wages. So when minimum price, okay, when the minimum price, uh, minimum wage increase from 1,005 to 1,008, it is a cost factor to the firm in which we call it as cost of labor. So therefore, your money wages increase. Okay, so again, it's fall under this category. Now, bear in mind, this one, we are only shifting the SAS curve. LIS has nothing to do uh, with this first scenario. Then we can have a look into the second scenario in which, okay, we will shift the LAS curve, okay? But bear in mind, whenever you shift LAS curve, uh, any factors that shift LAS curve will shift the SAS curve as well. I repeat, whatever points that shift the LAS curve or LAS curve, it will shift the SAS curve as well. So as long as this shift, this will also shift. Both will shift together if the long run one is being affected. Okay, so how do we how do we uh 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 how do we have an impact on the change in the long run aggregate supply curve? So that basically refers to the change in potential GDP. So that means as long as there's a change in potential GDP, that means that my LAS curve will be affected, and therefore my SAS curve will be affected. So therefore, in my graph, okay, when I shift my LAS curve, my SAS curve will shift as well. So from this point to this point. The price never remain the same because this is non-price factor, nothing to do with the price. But now, the potential GDP in the country has increased from point A to point B. What can cause this then? Now, in your tutorial one, if you still remember, we learned about the ways of achieving our ways of increasing long-term economic growth. Right. Uh, last time we learned about ways of long-term economic growth. So we have two methods. One is increase the factor quantity, and one is increasing the factor quality. Right. Something like this. And I told you that uh, we talk about increase in factor quantity is like for example more people coming into the country. Factor quantity. Right? So for example now uh more people coming in increase in the number of labor, increase in the number of labor for example maybe more more immigrants coming into a country so more labor here or another part here about increasing factor quality we have what the three methods uh we have human improvement in human capital okay we have increase in the physical capital more machineries more technology more equipment and last one we have technological advancements so all these factors that can increase the long-term economic growth will actually will have an impact on potential GDP. 
Okay, so I repeat, whatever points, okay, that will achieve long-term economic growth will definitely affect the potential GDP in which it will shift the LS curve and then SAS curve will follow as well. Okay, so these are the factors that will cause the LS curve to shift rightwards. And that sums up the things you need to know for your aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So just very simple. You have aggregate demand and aggregate supply. Okay, focus on price factor and non-price factors. That's for your explanation purposes. Physical capital. Then I did that. Okay, so we are done with the recap and let's move on to the questions. Okay, outline the factors which determine aggregate demand. Okay, first of all, huh? now what determines aggregate demand? Okay, first of all, we have just learned, okay, um, when you look into aggregate demand curve, Okay, when you look into aggregate demand curve, we look into the relationship between price level and the quantity of real GDP demanded. Okay, so that means, first of all, before I answer the questions, huh, I'm just telling you some extra info here as a recap. So that means today when I look into my quantity of real GDP, what it depends on? It depends on the price level. Okay, so that means today when I look into AD curve, it looks into a relationship of these two variables. That means that today I look into how is that uh, the price level affects the quantity of real GDP demanded. Okay, now what determines aggregate demand? We look into the four components, which are consumption plus investments plus government spending plus net exports. That equals the components of aggregate demand. Okay. What factors explains why the AD curve is downward sloping? What is the answers for this one? What factor explains? So uh, this is why uh, a bit risky. Why? Because uh, some students might go and say the inverse relationship only. Oh, they say price level goes up, quantity of real GDP goes down. Price level goes down, quantity of real GDP goes up. Zero mark. Why? Because you did not explain the effects. What? Okay. So here they are, they are, explain, uh, they are asking you to, about the explanations. The explanations of why Eddie curve is downward sloping. Why is that downward sloping? Because of the effects, the income, uh, the uh, real wealth effect and the substitution effect. Okay, so this one, we are talking about the price factor. Okay, this is my price level. This is my quantity of real GDP. Okay, you explain why is that eddy curve downward sloping. So this one, why is that downward sloping? You are talking about the real wealth effect and substitution effect. Okay, continue. Which factors produce a change in aggregate demand? And result in the curve shifting. So when I say a change in aggregate demand, what do we mean? We mean the shift, the non-price factors. Okay? That's for the answers for question number one. Basically, it refers everything in your notes. Okay, question number two, outline the factors which determine short-run aggregate supply curve and long-run aggregate supply curve. 
Okay, what the factors that determine this true? Okay, and give examples of factors that produce a change in aggregate supply curve. That means a shift. So two components here. The first one is asking you about the price factor. Okay, the first part is about asking you to talk about the price factor in which we call as movement along the straight line. Another one we are talking about a shift. Okay, we call as non price factor. That means you're referring to the shift. Basically, this is just like what we covered in the notes just now. So I've put in your table over here. Let's have a look. Okay, so when we talk about a uh, short run aggregate supply curve, okay, when we talk about the price factor, uh, we already mentioned that first of all, whether you look into SAS or LIS, whether it's short run or long run, we look into the relationship of uh, the price level and the quantity of real GDP supply. Quantity of real GDP supply and price level. Quantity of real GDP supply and price level. Okay, but the difference here is in the short run, we assume that everything remains constant. Your money wages remain constant. Okay. Whereas in the long run, we assume that money wages will change instead with price level. Okay, like for example, uh, two scenarios. Okay, you think you can think about uh the, the two scenarios here for long run aggregate supply. Uh when I say uh, money wages are what we call as uh, adjustable or flexible means what? Like first of all, for example, you overwork already, okay? Like now the economy overworks, so you keep high, uh, you keep, you want to use more of a labor. So what happens is labor will come to you and ask for higher wages. Or second thing is because in the long run, right, the price will continue to go up further and further. So when price level go up further and further, uh, the workers will come to you and say, oh, you know what? Since now things becoming more expensive, I would like to ask for higher pay or higher wages. Why? Because I want to remain my real va uh, real value of my income. Okay, so uh, two things here. Okay, you can see uh, one thing it can be because economy is overworked. Second is because price level is very high. Therefore, at the end, we result in the same outcome in which the uh, labor, the workers will come to and ask for higher wages a rise in the factor prices, okay? So that's basically I put into words here already, yeah? you can read through that. Now, what we what will affect the shift then? So for the shift, okay, for the SAS, basically it refers to anything that is related to the cost of inputs. Like, for example, change in money wages, change in the cost of inputs, all these will cause the supply curve to shift. But on the long run, I guess, supply curve, Okay, it will only shift if only if there's change in the potential GDP in the country, which is due to, for example, more quantity of labor, better labor skills like human capital, uh, increase in the physical capital, technological advancements, or discovery of new resources. Okay, again, this is what we covered just now in the recap. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Question three. Okay, so question three is to introduce you, okay, on how we can look into a diagram where aggregate demand, aggregate supply, and long-run aggregate supply all being incorporated. So first of all, let's have a look into this scenario. On my y-axis is price level. On my x-axis is real GDP, okay? We have aggregate, sub aggregate demand curve, which is tower sloping. Aggregate supply curve, this one is SAS, short-run aggregate supply curve. Okay, and we have long run aggregate supply curve, which is our potential GDP. So this is our long run aggregate supply curve. Okay, so let's have a look into the question. Determine the equilibrium price level and real GDP. Equilibrium price level and real GDP in the above figure. So how do we de de determine that? We look into the intersection between the aggregate demand curve and aggregate supply curve, which is here. Okay, so at the price level of 110, at the quantity of 30.5 trillion. Okay. Now, next question. Does this economy have a recessionary or inflationary gap? So you see, where's my poten uh, where's my potential outputs? My potential output is here. Where am I currently operating at? At here. Am I operating beyond the capacity of the economy? Wait, see properly? See, uh, my capacity is 
20 trillion, but I'm operating at 20.5 trillion. Am I operating beyond the capacity of economy? Yes. Okay. So therefore, there is inflationary gap. This is the this is the inflationary gap. I work beyond the capacity already. Okay, so therefore, it is about the inflationary gap. Okay, next question. Which curve will shift as the economy adjusts towards full employment? That means the long run. Okay, in the long run, where your money will just become adjustable already. So you see, just now I told you what? This inflationary gap, that means what? That means your economy is overworked. So when people overwork, okay, when the labor in the country overwork, what will they do? They come to you and ask for higher wages. So that's when your cost will start to rise and therefore affect your short run aggregate supply curve. Yeah. So therefore, which curve it will affect? It is about the aggregate supply curve. Why? Because it's already overwork. The workers will ask for higher wages and that increase your cost of production. Therefore, it shift the SAS curve leftwards. Yeah. So SAS curve will shift leftwards. Why? Because uh the the wages will increase or the cost of cost of inputs will increase and therefore cause the SAS curve to shift leftwards. Shift leftwards to here. Shift back to the capacity of the economy. SAS one. Shift leftwards. So where's my new equivalent point over here? Now it's here. Okay, from point A here to point B here, in which we go back to the full employment position. And where is my new price level? Here, 1 to 0. Okay, so aggregate supply curve will shift leftwards. So, okay, at the end, what is the question? What is the equilibrium real GDP and price level that the economy will ultimately achieve? That means eventually achieve. Okay, so at the end, once it goes back to the capacity of the economy, the final answer will be, price level will be 120, and the real GDP will be 20 trillion. Okay, moving on to the next question. Huh? Question four. Okay. Question four in your tutorial is only A or only, uh? I give A and B. Okay, B is the extra question from my end. Okay, now, question four. Assume that an economy is at full employment. Remember, when you answer any of the exam questions, you must see what is the assumption that gives you. Okay, because later when you draw the graph, if you draw it wrongly, your starting point wrong, the whole thing will be gone already. So remember to read the assumption. Use an ADAS diagram to explain what happens in the short run as a result of a rise in investment. Okay, so rise in investment, investment increase. Investment is one of the component of aggregate demand. So aggregate demand curve will shift rightwards. Easy. Okay, so aggregate demand curve will shift rightwards. And how it affects the real GDP and the price level. That's your final outcomes you're going to talk about. Now, in your study guide, it has provided you some points here, these are the points that you should involve, okay, that you should involve in your analysis. Actually, uh, last time before the format has been changed, uh, there will be uh, questions like this where they ask you to analyze ADAS in a very detailed manner. So this kind of question can carry about 8 to 12 marks last time, but now no more. So uh, she removed ready. So that means now, even when you answer questions like this on ADAS analysis, right, it probably carry less than eight marks. So that means the answers you need to write do not have to be as detailed as what I'm going to show you later on. Okay. Uh, but maybe if you want, you can put it into your assignments. Okay. So these are the uh, hints here. 
But I do want to talk about hints because that one you can read yourself. I want to show you the answers here because here I can show you how I put all the recap uh, that I talked about just now into words. Okay. Now, first of all, now we focus on question A. Yeah? Okay. So first of all, you draw a diagram. Diagram is important. Okay. On my y-axis is price level. On my x-axis is GDP. We have aggregate demand curve and aggregate supply curve. And we have long run aggregate supply curve. Now, bear in mind what we start at the full employment. So at point A here. Yeah, so that means you can see initially I start everything at the origin here, in which my AD equals to SAS and equals to LAS as well. Okay, so you see, uh, it goes just now assumption. <coughs> assumption. We say AD equals to SAS and it also equals to LAS. Why? Because full employment. We start from full employment. Okay. And what happened is, now there is an increase in investment that will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift to the right. So, now aggregate demand curve shift rightwards as you can see the red color arrow here. From point A to point B here already. Okay. Your new aggregate demand curve. Okay, now we haven't moved back to the final equilibrium uh, because now we need to explain. Okay, see ya. Uh, now you come to point B ready. Okay, you have to explain. How is that from point B, my aggregate demand curve, this one, go up to point C. Okay. So my blue color one here, okay, you can see from point B to point C is what? Like you can see the price level becomes higher. So therefore, quantity of real GDP becomes going down. Here, point B to point C is a movement along the straight line. I'm trying to explain the movement along the straight line for this point B to point C. Okay, so this one is about the movement. The movement, the expansion of the movement, in which I'm saying that when the price level goes up, quantity of real GDP will go down. How do I explain that? I have to use real wealth effect and substitution effect, okay? On the other hand, my supply curve, you can see, how is that from point A here, moving to point C, this green color one, okay? This one, I use the incentive effect, or you can say the, the money wages, while, while the money wages is constant. I think it's not sure. Uh, Okay. Okay. From point. A, okay. From point A. Okay. To point C here. This one. Movement along the straight line for supply curve. This one we use the incentive effect. Okay. Or just now we talk about the sticky wages. Okay. To talk about the movement of the supply curve when price level goes up quantity of real gdp increases okay that means that when price level goes up you will try to take advantage to produce more while the money wages remain constant so i have to put all this into words real world effects effects and this incentive effect okay So let's have a look here. Now I repeat that uh, no need to go and write this so detailed like this, huh? So no need to write until so detailed. I'm just showing you a full answer over here so that you can revise, you can read, okay? But you can make it short, yeah? Okay, see this, huh? First of all, I say that the rise in investment will shift the eddy curve, okay? So once it shifts the eddy curve, okay, from point A to point B, there will be a stock shortages from point A to point B, okay? You see why? Because, because at point B here, this is my aggregate demand, okay? But this is my aggregate supply. So aggregate demand more than aggregate supply. This is what it calls shortage. 
All right? Yeah. So therefore, causing stock shortages. Then after that, I thought about real wealth effect. Okay. Uh, like for example, price level becomes higher. So what happened is there's a fall in the real wealth effect. People will save more rather than spending. So causing a fall in uh real quantity of uh quantity of real GDP demanded. And then I thought about intertemporal effect. A higher price level means more transaction demand for money. So therefore, there will be an increase in interest rate as shown in the money market due to the decrease in the real value of money. And therefore, this increased the cost of borrowing, reduced the quantity of real GDP demanded. And another one, international substitution effect. A higher price level makes your local products expensive and unattractive to the local people. So local people and foreigners will replace the local goods with foreign goods. Okay, you will replace local goods with foreign goods, reducing the quantity of real GDP demanded. Okay, and for the uh, supply curve, okay, you can say a higher price create an incentive effect for the producers to produce more due to profit motive while the money wages remain constant. At the end, shortage is resolved and it comes back to the equilibrium point C over here. But at point C here, can you tell me what gap you are having here? This is your capacity of the economy. Okay, but you're operating here. So there is a gap. Yeah, there's a gap here. So this triangle over here is the in, uh, is the gap, the inflationary gap. You are operating beyond the potential GDP. So that means I can write as uh, real GDP. Thank you, I've written here. Real GDP larger than potential GDP, we call it as inflationary gap. Okay? So in this question A, it results in the final outcome of inflationary gap. So that means that my price level, my price level becomes higher and real GDP becomes higher. Answering the questions. They ask you about what happens to the price level at the quantity of real GDP. So that's the answer for question A. Of course, you do have to write that long. Okay, now I insert another question B. Now, assume the market is efficient. So use an ADAS diagram to explain what will happen to the economy in the long run as a result of the effects of the economy in the question A. That means what? Here I am to talk about long run. That means money wages become flexible. So that means what? That means now back to this scenario, question A, already overwork. Okay, that means now people will ask for higher wages already. So therefore, I want to talk about the impacts of the long run. Okay, so that leads me to question B. So we first start with inflationary gap, right? Because we say that uh, just now we stop in, in, with inflationary gap, right? So point C here is now our starting point. You can see LAS here is the capacity. This is the capacity of the economy. Okay, and now you're operating here, point C. Okay, inflationary gap. Where is the gap here? You can see the gap is here. Okay. So what happened is, workers ask for higher wages in the long run. Okay, so therefore, I put in the red color line over here. The existence of inflationary gap will push up the money wages as labor will start to seeking for higher wages when they are overworked. So therefore, this increase in the factor prices will shift the SAS curve leftwards, okay? So SAS curve will shift leftwards, okay, to from point C to point D over here. Okay, so at point D, what happened is your uh, your aggregate supply, okay, your SAS curve is at this amount, Y2, but your aggregate demand is at Y1. So what can you see over here? Your, at this point, okay, you can see your SAS curve is way lesser than aggregate demand. That means demand more than supply. Means what? Means there will be a stock shortages. Stock shortages will cause what? Will cause the price level to go up. So therefore, from point D, it will go up to point E over here. Okay? But we need to explain the effects. How this one here goes up. Okay? From, from uh, how and, and how this one here go up here. Okay, so therefore, when we talk about aggregate supply here, okay, we get we use the incentive effect. Again, uh, the same thing basically. Okay, and on my 
uh, aggregate demand curve here to talk about the movement along the straight line, I will use the real wealth effect and the substitution effect. Again, I put everything into words. Okay, so you can see how I put into words. Let me know if you need more time uh, to write out anything. Okay, so same thing here. First of all, of course, you do not have to write that long. I'm just showing you the explanation. First, you talk about higher price level, reduce your real wealth effect. Okay, people spend, uh, people will save more instead of spending. And then talk about intertemporary effect means higher price level means more transaction demand for money. And therefore, that result in higher interest rate. And therefore, that decreased the uh that 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 de uh, because of the decrease in the real value of money, so that decreases the quantity of real GDP demanded. What about international substitution effect, higher price level makes your local products expensive. No one want to buy your products anymore, reducing your real uh the real GDP demanded. And then we talk about uh SAS curve. Okay, a higher price level creates an incentive effect for the producer to produce more, while money wages is constant. In, uh, in, in the long run here, we say that once it's shifted, once the money we just uh, shifted already, but at the same time, uh, in the short run, the short run of the long run, basically. Yeah. So that, that, mean, that means that the price level becomes higher, you still can produce more. Okay. Uh, at the end, shortage is resolved and it backs to the uh, equilibrium. So at the new equilibrium, what can we see here? The price level definitely becomes higher and it goes back to the full employment. Okay. So we can see the outcomes. It's moved back to the full employment with no output gap, okay, operating where real GDP equal to potential GDP, okay, but the price level is higher. So again, uh, when you write, if let's say this really comes out in your exam, uh, actually they would you you don't have to write uh you don't have to write that long, uh, so just keep it short as long as you have all the substitution effects uh keywords in that that should be all right. Okay, so let's have a look into the next question. Okay, uh, we will discuss this question and then two more questions, then uh, one or two more questions, then we are done. Okay, if the economy is a full employment, again, remember the assumption, and aggregate demand rises, aggregate demand increases. Explain the immediate impact of this increase. Additionally, describe how the economy readjusts to the full employment. So it's basically where, asked, where they ask you about short run 
and long run? Basically, the same answers in your question 4A and B, okay? But here, actually, I think what they are expecting you to write is basically like this only. Why? Because uh, if they ask about this, right, maybe it's just only 5 to 6 marks. 5 to 6 marks to do not help you go and write something like this, uh, okay? Unless you're very free in the exam. So what you can do is actually, I think this is what they expect in the based on your uh based on the new based on the based on the new format okay so i draw the diagram first okay it's basically the same thing so first of all okay we have origin we have price level and we have quantity of real gdp okay and we have aggregate demand curve and we have SAS curve and we start at the full employment okay which is here point A at the full employment at this price level let's say uh, we put P0 you can just put P0 huh? okay now a rise in aggregate demand okay so my aggregate demand curve will shift rightwards. Make sure it's parallel. Uh, okay. So aggregate demand curve shift rightwards from point A to point B here. Okay. So that's a shortage. Shortage will push up the price to point C here. So at the end, there is inflationary gap. Okay. So therefore, you see how they put into words, huh? The immediate effect of an increase in aggregate demand is to increase both the price level and real GDP. C is correct or not? So at the end, point C here, my real GDP is here, Y1, okay? And my, where is my price level? My price level is here, T1. Yep, price level is higher, quantity of real GDP higher. Correct, okay? So therefore, price level and real GDP both go up. The money wages does not change in the short run, okay? So with the higher price, uh, with the higher price level, the real wage rate falls. So that means now what happened is they will start to adjust ready. So eventually, workers will demand for a higher wage rate to compensate for the higher price level. That means soon in the long run, this is for the long run already, okay? Because you overwork already, ma. okay? Inflationary gap. You can talk about inflationary gap here, okay? Now, what happened is, because I say that now they will start for asking for higher wages. Now we talk about long run impacts. What happened is your cost will start to increase and therefore it will shift the SAS curve leftwards. Okay. Because you have to pay higher wages. Okay. So therefore, aggregate supply decreases. Okay. So uh, workers will start to uh, demand for higher wages. Okay. Workers will start to demand for higher wages and aggregate supply to decrease until it reach full employment. Talk about this sentence first. They only talk about the result. The result is this one. Price level rises and real GDP decrease. This one should put at the back actually. So you should talk about this sentence first. But it's okay. It doesn't matter with the sequence. Okay. So therefore, now I draw the diagram. Okay. SAS curve will shift leftwards. Why? Because people start to ask for higher wages. Okay, so from point C, move here, move to point D here. So again, there's a shortages causing the price to go up to point E. So therefore, back to full employment, but the price level becomes higher. Okay, so at this point, the money wage rate has increased enough. So the real wage rate is back to initial level. So real GDP equals to potential GDP again. So the change in real GDP is only temporarily, but the price level, the increase in the price level is permanent. The one in red color is the most important. That's the outcome. And understand, right? This one. Everyone confused? Okay. No, okay. Okay, no. <laughs> So it's the same thing of question four. So it backs to full employment. That means actually there's no change in the real GDP at the end. Okay. But the price level has been built in. So the price becomes higher. That one is uh, fixed really.
só ele assim. Olha isso aí, Bebê. Okay, okay, okay. Excuse me, this is Okay, can uh, Okay, let's have a look into uh one more question. One more question, uh. Okay, uh tutorial four. Okay, tutorial four is just applications. Okay, applications only. Okay, uh you can write it down. Uh I mean I'm going to show some mind map. Okay, question one. During an economic recession, that means the country is not doing good. Okay, the economy is not doing good. What is likely to happen to aggregate demand and aggregate supply in the short run? Okay. And how my policy makers respond to the issues? What are the policies la, to solve the issue? Okay, so therefore, here, uh, we talk about recession. That means the, uh, the economy is not doing good. So that means uh, consumption will fall, uh, investment will fall, government spending will fall, and net exports will fall. So basically, aggregate demand, okay, aggregate demand will go leftwards. Why? Because Consumption might fall, investment might fall, government spending might fall, next exports might fall. Okay, so aggregate demand curve will shift leftwards. This one, you don't need to draw any graph. Huh? This one, uh, if it comes up, maybe four marks, five marks like that, you explain, okay? And what about aggregate supply? Again, because economy is not doing good, what happens is your aggregate supply may fall as well. Okay, or require a short run aggregate supply will fall as well. Okay, so therefore, AD curve and SAS curve will shift leftwards. Okay, why? Because of the fall in the consumer confidence. Okay, and then uh, it's very hard for the business. So you can explain as well. Like for example, the fall in aggregate demand is because uh fall in the consumer confidence, and then at the same time, uh, business are very hard to sell the goods and services, so they cut off the production, they lay off the workers, so aggregate supply also decrease. Okay, how the policy makers respond to this? You will learn more in the upcoming classes, but I want to give you a mind map to give a preview first. This one, uh, actually, they shouldn't even put it to the four. Actually, to last time, don't have to the four one, uh, by the way. To the four straight, go for another topic already. I don't know why suddenly this semester they changed, they put one to the four over here. Actually, you can't even answer question one and two because you haven't learned all these two yet. Okay, now let me show you uh, how we can solve this issue. Uh. Okay, this one you may want to write down already. Okay. Okay, so we talk about policies now. Okay, we we'll talk about policies. Okay, so first of all, right? Uh, it is we talk about policies. Okay. Um, uh, in this scenario, okay, we want to boost the aggregate demand because you know, for example, the economy is not doing good. Okay, what happened is uh we want to boost the aggregate demand. Let's say uh to increase the aggregate demand. So what, what you should do, you should use demand side policies. Okay. Okay. So we have two types of demand side policies that you're going to learn in upcoming classes in which there's also the answers for these questions. One is fiscal policy. And the other one is monetary policy. Okay, why we call them as demand side? Because these two policies is used to influence aggregate demand, either to go up or go down. Okay, so we talk about fiscal policies. We have expansionary and contractionary. Expansionary fiscal policy and 
contractionary fiscal policy. Expansionary is to increase the aggregate demand. Contractionary is to decrease the aggregate demand. Same thing here. When we look into monetary policy, we have expansionary monetary policy and contractionary monetary policy. Okay, so as long as I use the word expansionary means is to increase equity demand and contractionary is to decrease equity demand. Now we look into what are the instruments of each policy. For expansionary fiscal policy, government will increase the government spending and reduce the taxation. For contractionary fiscal policy, because you want to reduce the aggregate demand, government will reduce the government spending and increase the taxation. Okay. For monetary policy, there are three instruments, but uh, as far as the syllabus is concerned, you only learn two. To increase aggregate demand, the, the central bank or the government will increase the money supply, reduce the interest rate, and reduce the exchange rate. But you do not learn about the exchange rate here. This one, you can ignore it. You only learn uh, the basic. Okay, to reduce the aggregate demand, government will reduce the money supply, increase the interest rate, and to increase the exchange rate, to appreciate, to revalue the currency. Okay, now, what is the question just now? The question say, the country is not doing good, right? <coughs> so, in the question, there is recession, right? Recession is usually caused by what? By fall in aggregate demand. Okay? Fall in aggregate demand. So therefore, now you want to solve this problem. That means you want aggregate demand to increase. You want this to increase. Okay? You want to increase. So that means which policy you should use. You should use expansionary fiscal policy and expansionary monetary policy. And these are the instruments. So just put whatever I highlight in yellow into the answers. That's the question that's answered for this question but bear in mind that is there a risk when they use this kind of policy yes why because when they increase aggregate demand by too much it may cause inflation which you will learn in the upcoming chapters Who's <laughs> 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 Yes, anything not sure? Let me know because all your short talks. What? Yeah. Okay, all good. Okay, so um basically I put everything into words, you can go through that, and then you can see at the end I say that there is a risk as well. So although all this is good because it can increase the production, employment, and economic growth, but there's a risk. Why? Because it may result in inflation or too much of debts because you spend too much. The government spend too much. Okay, so I will stop until here. Question 2, 3, and 4 we will discuss in next week. And then after these three questions, then we will move on to the, to the uh, tutorial 2. Yeah, so 
Okay. Um. Yep. Let me stop recording.